I just want to take a minute to let you know, if you like This Is Monsters, you might like my other show, Somewhere Sinister. Each season, we go to a different place and tell sinister stories from that area. You can check it out by going to this link here. Thanks so much, and on to the story. Picture in your mind the mountains that encircle the vibrant city of San Francisco. Maybe you've seen them in the background of pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge or on postcards which attempt to capture the city's iconic beauty. These towering giants are home to dense forests, rugged cliffs, and lofty peaks. And for at least two years, they were also the hunting ground of one of America's most ruthless predators. This is Monsters. David Joseph Carpenter was born on May 6, 1930 in San Francisco to Elwood and Francis Carpenter. As a child, David suffered from various problems including bedwetting, stammering, and learning difficulties. These days, we know issues like that are often indicative of a traumatic home life, and that was certainly the case for David. Both of his parents were physically and emotionally abusive, and his home life was far from stable. Their neglect cast a long shadow over David's life. David's father, Elwood, was a domineering figure with an aggressive approach to parenting. He relentlessly ridiculed David for his bedwetting and his stammer even though both were likely caused, at least in part, by his own actions. On top of that, he was a violent alcoholic who took his issues out on his wife and child. Then there was David's mother, Frances. She was about as far from a maternal figure as you could possibly get. She was cold and distant and unable to offer even a tiny amount of comfort or kindness to her son. There was no safety or joy in David's home life, and sadly, the same was true outside of the home as well. For years, David was repeatedly mocked and teased about his stutter by his peers. He was regarded as an outcast or someone to pity, scorn, and sometimes even fear. Naturally, that treatment led to David becoming quiet and withdrawn. He was made even worse by the fact that his parents thought the best way to get rid of David's social anxiety was to enroll him in more extracurricular activities. Rather than have him join the hobbies that his classmates were interested in, though, David was forced to take ballet and piano lessons, which only made him the butt of even more ridicule on the schoolyard. As David grew into his teens, the feelings of isolation and anger grew as well. Soon, they had transformed into a deep hatred and resentment towards everyone, even those who dared show a semblance of kindness towards him. All of these pent-up emotions meant David was unable to pay attention in class, and he quickly fell behind his classmates academically. The constant humiliation at home and at school meant David was always on guard and ready to react with violence. It was the only way he knew how to process emotions, just like he had seen his father do for years. By the time he was 10 years old, David had developed a volatile temper on top of all of the other undesirable personality traits he had going against him. While these early experiences certainly don't excuse or justify the monstrous acts of the man David Carpenter would become, they provide insight into the twisted psyche of one of America's most notorious killers. His early life paints a picture of a deeply troubled individual whose path was undoubtedly shaped by a tumultuous upbringing. However troubled David's early childhood may have been, it paled in comparison to what came next. In his initial teen years, David began to exhibit some new and more concerning behaviors. He started to hurt animals, and when that wasn't enough, he would torture and kill them. Now, we all know what that means. By the time David was a young teen, the thrill of torturing an animal wasn't quite enough, and he moved on to hurting people, sexually. At age 14, he was committed to the Napa State Hospital in California for sexual offenses. The records behind those incidents are sealed, but given what he did next, it's not hard to imagine what he was locked up for. Just a couple of years after being released, David was back in front of the court again after molesting two of his cousins, a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. 
This time, he was sent to juvenile detention until he aged out of the system at 18. Thankfully, we all know sexual deviants and animal torturers grow out of their behavior by the time they're 18, and so no one had anything to worry about when David was released, right? The only thing that David's time in juvie had taught him was, next time, don't get caught. Fortunately, that would be easier said than done. In the years after his release, David appeared to live a regular life. His new lease on life was made even more believable when he got married and started a family of his own. In 1955, when David was 25 years old, he married 19-year-old Ellen. The couple had three children together, a boy and two girls. It will come as no surprise that all was not as it seemed behind the doors of the carpenter home. Ellen would later share that her husband was obsessed with sex. He was regularly violent and aggressive during intercourse, and he demanded sex three times a day, sometimes even more. That was even in the periods of time where she had just recently given birth to one of their children. By the time David had been married for five years, normalcy had lost its appeal. He needed a thrill, and in July of 1960, he got it. David was driving home one day when he noticed a woman walking on the side of the road. He recognized the woman as Lois Dandrade, who was a friend of his wife. David pulled over and asked if she would like a ride to work. Given that Lois knew and trusted David, she agreed and got into his car. But along the way, David took a wrong turn and then another. He claimed that he was lost and his driving became more and more erratic. Finally, he stopped the car in a densely wooded area in the Presidio of San Francisco. When the car came to a stop, Lois jumped out and began to question why he had brought her there. If Lois thought she would be safer outside of the car than inside it, she was about to be proven wrong. David came around to her side of the car with a knife in his hand. He pushed her to the ground, straddled her, and began to tie her hands up with a clothesline. During the confrontation, David's voice held no sign of the stammer he was known for. Lois began to scream and fight violently for her life, but David had come prepared. He took a hammer out of the vehicle and began to strike her in the head. Just as he was about to rape Lois, they heard a voice. A military patrol officer had seen David's erratic driving and had turned around to follow the vehicle. The area David had driven into was a military area with limited accessibility. Along the way, the officer had lost sight of David's car, but he hadn't stopped looking. Out of the woods, he heard Lois's terrifying screams, and he arrived in time to see David attacking her with a hammer. He pulled over and demanded that David stop hitting her. But instead of doing what he was told, David pulled out a gun and fired towards the officer. The officer returned fire and hit David in the stomach and the leg. That gave Lois a moment's opportunity to break free. Unfortunately, the bullet David took wasn't lethal, and he was left with a flesh wound. When the military police arrived, David was taken into custody and Lois was transferred to the hospital. She required reconstructive surgery on her skull, but was able to make a full recovery, at least physically. David was charged with assault and kidnapping on a military base. In court, he claimed that he had blacked out during the attack, but he was found guilty and sentenced to 14 years in federal prison. He was released after serving just nine years of his sentence. During David's time in prison, Ellen had filed for divorce, and David returned to live with his parents after his release. Once he was free, David wasted no time in getting remarried and, of course, reoffending. Within a year of his release, he was back in custody, this time for robbery, kidnapping, and attempted rape. He had attempted to kidnap a woman by crashing into her car, which made her exit the vehicle. When David tried to force her into his car, she resisted and he stabbed her. Somehow she broke free and managed to get back into her own car and drive away for help. She survived, but David's next victims would not be so lucky. David was sentenced to seven years in prison for kidnap and robbery as well as two additional years for violating his parole. Somehow, in the intervening years between the attack and when he appeared in court for the kidnapping, all of the rape charges had been dropped. This meant that when David walked free in May of 1979, he was never listed on the sex offender registry. That was despite a psychiatrist who assessed David around that time noting, quote, 
Ever since the age of eight, whenever he was under significant stress, he would commit a sex offense. The only way he can think straight is to rape the nearest female. During his fourth round of freedom, David went to great lengths to pass as a normal average citizen. He didn't have the wife and children to legitimize his image anymore, so instead he focused on employment and hobbies. He took courses in computer printing at the California Trade School and graduated with a degree which he used to secure a job. In his spare time, he took up hiking. While most hikers take up the sport for the physical challenge or the allure of beautiful untouched landscapes, David had other, more sinister intentions. To the unsuspecting outsider, he was merely another face in the crowd of nature enthusiasts, another soul-seeking solitude in the wilderness. But underneath the backpack and layers of outdoor clothing, David saw the trails as a secluded and private hunting ground. The hills of Northern California have always been regarded as a sanctuary for those seeking refuge from the chaos of city life. Mount Tamalpais State Park, a mere stone's throw from the hustle and bustle of San Francisco, is a jewel of serenity nestled in the heart of Marin County. With its network of winding trails, it has been a treasured paradise for nature lovers and outdoor enthusiasts for generations. Its lush forests, stunning wildflower displays, and panoramic views of the Pacific Ocean have always painted a tranquil, idyllic landscape. It was the search for serenity that first drew 44-year-old Etta Kane to Mount Tamalpais. Her favorite viewpoint was a spot that looked down over the wide expanse of the San Francisco Bay with the iconic Golden Gate Bridge nestled right in the middle. On August 19, 1979, she set off to spend the afternoon hiking the trails as she had done so many times before. When she failed to return home that evening, her husband reported her missing and a search began. Despite hours of searching, there was no sign of Etta, and at around midnight, with the weather closing in, the search was called off. At dawn the next morning, searchers set off again. It wasn't long before they found what they were looking for, but it wasn't good news. Etta's body was found in a remote part of the mountains. She was completely naked in a kneeling position, and she had been shot in the back of her head, execution style. Her bag was close to her body, but her credit cards, cash, and sunglasses were missing. It would be years before officials realized that Etta was the first victim of the trailside killer, and he was just warming up. On October 21st, 23-year-old Mary Frances Bennett set off for a hike near the Palace of the Legion of Honor at Land's End. Mary was new to the area after moving from Montana when she graduated from accounting school. She was excited to experience the landscape of her new city, which made her feel connected with those she was familiar with back in Montana. That afternoon, golfers who were playing around at the course next to the trail heard long and agonized screams coming from the forest. Not wanting to interrupt their golf game, they chose to ignore the sounds. Just hours after those noises were heard, hikers on the trail found Mary's still warm body laying face down under a layer of dirt and branches. She had been mutilated and stabbed at least 25 times. Here's a tip for being a decent human being. If you hear someone in distress, help out. If you don't feel safe approaching the situation, call someone. At the very least, let someone know. In March of 1980, 23-year-old Barbara Schwartz went hiking with her dog on the same trail Etta had been murdered on six months earlier. Barbara was an organic bead maker and a local of the area. She was very familiar with the trail. A female jogger who was just a few minutes behind Barbara that day heard screaming and saw a man attacking a woman on the trail while her dog went nuts. The woman yelled at the man to stop and then ran for help. By the time she returned with the police, the man was gone and Barbara was already dead. Barbara was found in the same kneeling position as Etta, but instead of being shot, she had been stabbed 12 times with a 10-inch knife. A few days after the murder, curious teens who had gone to check out the scene found a boning knife covered in blood nearby where Barbara had been murdered. A reporter who had heard the report come across a police radio raced to the scene. They arrived at the scene before police and picked up the knife which eliminated any usable fingerprints from the handle. The knife was later confirmed as the murder weapon. Here's another tip for being a decent human being. If you believe you've found a murder weapon or any evidence of a crime really, don't touch it.
you don't need to pick up a bloody knife that may have caused someone's death. Officers also found a pair of prescription glasses at the scene of Barbara's murder that they believed belonged to the killer. The glasses were traced to the California prison system, but no definitive match could be made to whoever had once owned them. While the physical evidence turned out to be dead ends, there were two eyewitnesses from the trail that day who could provide a physical description of the killer. There was the woman who had seen the attack and ran for help, as well as a friend of Barbara who was hiking with her that day. The friend told investigators that she was about a hundred yards ahead of Barbara when she came across a man hidden in the bushes to the side of the trail. When the woman spoke to the man, he acted casual and told her that he had gone into the bushes to relieve himself. Thanks to the eyewitnesses, homicide detectives now had a general description of the killer. The jogger described him as slim and somewhere around age 25. Investigators released a composite sketch of the supposed killer where they described him as a handsome man aged 28 to 35 years old. When the killer was profiled, the report described him as having a winning personality who didn't initially frighten his victims. That was based on the fact that the friend who had run into the man in the bushes wasn't frightened. Unfortunately, none of those assumptions were even remotely accurate descriptions of David. He was of a heavier build at the time of the murders, and he was 50 years old. And you already know enough about his personality to know there was nothing winning about it. Unsurprisingly, because the sketch and description of David was so far off, no helpful tips came in. In December of 1980, a man called a local television station at least 15 times claiming to be the trailside killer. He told them that he was, quote, tormented from inside by voices, and he agreed to turn himself in, but he never showed up. Barbara's stabbing was the third violent and unsolved murder on the trail in less than a year, and the local community was worried there was a serial killer on the loose. Because, well, there was. The once tranquil trails took on a haunting edge, and rumors of a trailside killer spread quickly through San Francisco. Signs warning hikers to be on alert and advising them not to walk alone were posted at entrances to the trails, but the warnings went unheeded. On October 11, 1980, 19-year-old Richard Stowers and his 18-year-old girlfriend Cynthia Moreland set off on a romantic hike at Point Reyes National Seashore Park. Richard was stationed with the U.S. Coast Guard and Cynthia had just finished high school. The couple were young, but they knew they wanted to get married and had already talked about dates. By now, you already know, they never came home. Subsequent searches turned up no sign of the young couple. On October 15th, 26-year-old Ann Alderson went for a walk in the woods in Mount Tamalpais State Park. She never returned home either. Two days later, her body was found in a familiar kneeling position. Like Edda, Anne had been shot in the head three times, but unlike the previous victim, the medical examiner was able to determine that Anne had been raped before her death. On November 28th, 22-year-old Diane O'Connell and 25-year-old Shauna May set off to hike the Point Reyes National Seashore Park on the Sky Trail. The two women were hiking in separate groups and were unknown to each other, but their fates will forever be entwined. That day, Diane was hiking with two friends, and at some point she had become separated from the group. When her friends reached the bottom of the trail, there was no sign of Diane, and they set off back up the path to find her. When they found no sign of her, they decided to call the police. When police and rangers arrived to begin the search, they were briefed about Diane's appearance and what she was wearing that day. A few hours later, an officer noticed a shoe sticking out of some ferns in a remote area of the trail. She took a closer look, even though it didn't match the description of Diane's footwear. There she found two bodies laying face down in the underbrush, a male and a female. They would later be identified as the missing couple Richard Stowers and Cynthia Moreland. So where was Diane? It turned out that she wasn't far away. A day after Richard and Cynthia were found, a searcher discovered Diane's body just 200 yards away from the dead couple. Diane was found laying face down, and next to her was the similarly positioned body of Shauna May. They were both naked. A pair of women's underwear was stuffed inside Diane's mouth, and another pair was lying next to her arm. She had been strangled with a piece of cord or wire. 
There was no sign of recent intercourse, whereas Shauna's anus and vagina contained sperm, indicating that she had been raped before or immediately after her death. Both Diane and Shauna had also been shot, and Shauna had been tied up with picture frame wire. Officials theorized that one of the women had come across the other one being attacked, and the killer had killed them both to avoid being caught. Despite four bodies being found in the span of a couple of days, officials were no closer to identifying their killer. While some of the deaths were instantly connected, such as those who were found in the kneeling position, the fact that some of the victims had been shot while others had been stabbed or strangled meant law enforcement weren't 100% sure they had all been murdered by the same person. More signs went up and visitor numbers to the trail dropped off steeply, but not everyone was afraid. And in March of 1981, the trailside killer struck again. On March 29, 1981, 20-year-old Ellen Hansen and her boyfriend Steve Herdel set off on a hike. They were both on spring break from UC Davis when they decided to walk across the Santa Cruz Mountains. On that day, they chose a trail in the Henry Cowell Redwoods State Park. During their walk, the couple passed by a man and waved a friendly hello. Less than an hour later, that same man stopped them as they returned from visiting an observation deck. Except this time, there was nothing friendly about their encounter. The man had a gun in his hand and walked towards them saying, quote, I see we meet again. He threatened the couple with the gun, and when Steve begged for him to let them go, his girlfriend said, quote, Steve, he's going to shoot us anyway. Don't listen to him. In a matter-of-fact voice, the man told them that all he wanted to do was rape Ellen, and he shoved them off to the side of the trail. Steve told him there was no way he was going to let that happen, and the man opened fire. He fired at least four shots at the couple, with one bullet hitting Steve in the neck. Steve momentarily blacked out, and when he came to, he realized that Ellen was dead. She had taken a bullet to the head. Steve took the opportunity to make a run for it, and he managed to make it back onto the trail where other hikers assisted him. By then, David had taken off into the woods in the opposite direction, leaving his two victims to bleed to death behind him. He didn't count on the fact that Steve would survive the shooting. When Steve was interviewed by the police, he was able to provide a detailed description of his girlfriend's killer. Finally, the police now knew that their man wasn't a 25-year-old with a winning personality. He was a middle-aged balding loser with crooked yellow teeth. Parkgoers also told them about a small foreign red car in the area that day and a picture of a similar vehicle was released alongside the sketch. The search for the trailside killer intensified and the composite sketch as well as details about the killer's clothing and vehicle ran in every major newspaper in San Francisco. Tips came in from every direction, but even with a more detailed and accurate description of the killer, they were no closer to identifying their man. DNA technology was still in its primitive years, and apart from Steve, no one had lived to tell their tale of crossing paths with the trailside killer. All that investigators had to go on was a physical description. Despite intense media coverage about the murders, the trailside killer wasn't put off. If anything, he was inspired to strike again. On May 1, 1981, 20-year-old Heather Skaggs became the trailside killer's final victim, and also his undoing. Unlike the other victims, she went missing after going to look at a car she was interested in buying. 23 days later, hikers in the Big Basin State Park found her nude body buried in a shallow grave. She had died from a point-blank gunshot wound to the face. Semen was also found in her vagina, indicating that she had been raped around the time of her death. With the discovery of Heather's body, investigators now had a definitive link between David and one of the murder victims who was found in the San Francisco mountains. See, Heather had a direct connection to David. She was a college student who worked part-time at the local Econo Quick Print alongside the man who would become her killer, David Carpenter. On the day she went missing, Heather told her boyfriend that David was taking her to look at a vehicle that one of his friends was selling. David had offered to drive her there and to look over the car to make sure it was in good condition, and he also offered to loan her the money she needed for the purchase. But he did one thing that had set off alarm bells for young Heather. David told her not to tell anyone where she was going or who she was going with. What David hadn't realized when he decided to kill Heather was that she had ignored his instructions. She had left David's details with her boyfriend. 
She had also spoken to her mother the night before she went missing and told her what she was doing the next day. On top of that, she had also mentioned to her mother that the trip didn't feel right. She was so distressed about it that she broke down crying on the phone. Her mother begged her not to go, but Heather reassured her and said, quote, Don't worry. Don't worry about it, Mom. Friends would later reveal that Heather always felt weird vibes when she was around David, especially after she heard her colleagues gossiping that David said he wanted to date her. David was 50 and Heather was 20 at the time. Because of his connection to Heather, as well as being the last person known to have seen her alive, David was brought in for questioning. He told investigators that he had overslept that day and he had never met up with her. But the officers noticed the striking resemblance between the composite sketch Steve had helped create and the man sitting in front of them. There were a few differences in David's appearance. He had grown a beard and he wasn't wearing glasses, but the similarities were indisputable. There was also the fact that David drove a small red Fiat, just like what witnesses had seen on the day Ellen was murdered. Heather's death also provided another major breakthrough. The 38 caliber handgun that had killed her could also be definitively matched to the gun that had killed Ellen Hansen. It was the first time multiple murders on the trails had been linked together with conclusive evidence. The handgun was recovered from a San Francisco construction site and tied to seven of the trailside killings. A friend of David later testified that she had bought the gun and given it to David. After he had used it for the murders, he handed the weapon over to two bank robbers he met while he was in prison. He had asked them to get rid of the weapon and they hid it at the construction site. When they were questioned as known accomplices of David, they revealed the location of the weapon to the police. On July 31, 1981, David Carpenter was arrested and charged with five counts of murder, rape, and attempted rape. The murder charges related to Richard Stowers, Cynthia Moreland, Shauna May, Diane O'Connell, and Ann Alderson. In his car and home, the police found more than 60 books about local hiking trails. At the time of David's arrest, he was back living with his parents. In court, David stuck to his story that he wasn't involved in any of the killings. His defense team called on experts who testified that shoe prints found at one of the scenes didn't belong to David, despite his own girlfriend testifying she had bought the shoes for him the day before the murder. Then, another expert said that the semen analysis from Ann Alderson's underwear was unreliable, and David swore that he had lost the jacket one of the eyewitnesses had testified seeing the killer wearing, despite his girlfriend saying he wore it every day. In fact, David managed to call multiple witnesses who testified that he couldn't have been the killer. There was an employer who said he was at work with her on the day one of the murders was committed, and documents from a medical clinic showing he was on the other side of town when Steve and Ellen were attacked. As for the prosecution, they had an answer for all of David's excuses. They called Steve into the stand, the only person known to have survived the trailside killer. Steven had picked David out of a lineup, and he told the court the haunting story of Ellen's murder. The prosecution also called experts of their own. They painted a chilling picture of a man who exhibited traits commonly associated with dangerous individuals. They highlighted his lack of empathy, his manipulative tendencies, and his disregard for the rights and well-being of others as proof that David was exactly the kind of person who would brutally murder anyone without any provocation. The prosecution witnesses also had evidence that David had forged the dates on the documents he was using to give himself an alibi. Ultimately, the jury sided with the prosecution and David was found guilty of all charges after two days of deliberations. During his sentencing hearing, the defense changed strategies. Rather than denying that David was guilty, they attempted to excuse his actions. They produced reports from psychiatrists and neuropsychologists about his troubled upbringing, which indicated that he had a mixed personality disorder with borderline narcissistic and antisocial features. They blamed all of his actions on his neglectful parents, and they argued that he shouldn't face the death penalty because his crimes had been impulsive, not planned, and he'd been unable to control himself. You know, unable to control himself for at least five murders. On November 16, 1984, David Carpenter was sentenced to death by gas chamber. He was later charged with the murders of Ellen and Heather and the attempted murder of Ellen's boyfriend. However, those convictions were overturned in 1995 due to juror misconduct. 
One of the jurors admitted she had known about David's prior convictions after reading about it in the news which she had not disclosed during jury selection. After years of back and forth about whether David would be given a new trial, the California Supreme Court reinstated the convictions, citing overwhelming evidence of his guilt. David has also been tied to a further five murders, which occurred in the state park surrounding San Francisco during the same time period he was known to be hunting in the area. There was 17-year-old Ann Menyavar, who was last seen on December 28, 1980, and whose decomposed remains were found six months later. Then there was 19-year-old Carol Laughlin, who went missing in September of 1979. Her remains were found in 1980. Both women could be tied to David, either through where they worked or places they regularly visited. Despite the links, David was never charged with those murders. He was also never charged with the murders of Etta, Barbara, or Mary. That is, despite DNA linking him to Mary's death and the kneeling position of Etta and Barbara matching one of David's confirmed victims. David was also once tied to the Zodiac killings that occurred around 10 years before the trailside murders. A person told the police that she believed David matched the composite sketches of the Zodiac serial killer she had seen in the paper. However, that connection was later dismissed because David was in prison at the time of the killings. In the wake of David's initial trial, officials faced questions about the number of missed opportunities for David to have been caught. There was the fact that David had never been added to the sex offender registry for his earlier offense. That turned out to be an administrative error due to him changing from state to federal custody. Then there was information indicating that he was once considered a possible suspect in the case, but the Department of Corrections overlooked him because he didn't look like the composite sketch. At the time he committed the murders, David was on parole. His parole officer believed David wasn't involved because he was meeting all of the conditions of his release. He had a full-time job, which meant he was unlikely to have the time to carry out the murders so frequently. Except by then, officials had already made the connection that all of the murders had taken place on a weekend or public holiday, meaning the killer likely had a full-time job. Days after David's arrest, his parole officer commented, quote, He's done everything you could ask anyone to do in terms of complying with his parole supervision. Oh, well I guess that means he couldn't possibly be a murderer then. It was also reported that when officers found the glasses at the scene of Barbara's murder, they issued a be-on-the-lookout alert to local optometrists in case someone came in looking for the same prescription. David did, in fact, replace his glasses, but the optometrist who served him didn't read the bolo and therefore didn't report it to police until years later. It also turned out that David had been injured during Barbara's attack and he went to a local hospital for treatment. Hospital staff filed a police report, but investigators never looked into it. It later came to light that a second profile of the trailside killer had been completed after the winning personality version. This time, the profiler stated the killer was likely familiar with the area, shy, reclusive, and may have had a speech impediment. He would also likely be unsure of himself in social situations, and he would choose his targets based on opportunity, not based on a preference for a particular type of victim. He was white, intelligent, blue-collar, and had spent time in jail. His M.O. was to approach victims from behind and become aggressive to overwhelm them. He was, quote, like a spider waiting for a bug to fly into his web. While he had committed rape before this series of murders, he had not killed. The profiler also indicated that the killer would have a history of at least two of the three background indicators. Cruelty to animals, obsession with fire setting, and issues with bedwetting beyond the typical age. Sound familiar? These three indicators are most commonly referred to as the triad of sociopathy, or sometimes the homicidal triad. According to the psychiatrist who came up with the theory, if two or more of these factors are present in a person as a child, they could potentially be predictive of violent tendencies or behaviors later in life and in particular, serial offenses. David exhibited two of the three signs before he was even a teenager and his early offenses indicated a deep-seated desire for control and dominance. It's important to mention that while the triad theory was influential and is widely taught, later research has generally not confirmed this line of thinking. Those who discredit the theory claim that the presence of these factors in a child's behavior does not necessarily mean they'll grow up to have violent tendencies or become serial offenders. 
The theory provides a possible explanation or pathway, but it's not a concrete or guaranteed predictor. Officials involved in the investigation into the trailside killer had largely discredited the second profile because they didn't understand how it could be so specific. This was particularly in relation to the comments about the killer having a speech impediment. The profiler backed up his theory by stating that the secluded killing areas, the method of approach, and the fact that the offender did not approach his victims in a social situation to lure them indicate some degree of shyness or shame. Overpowering someone gave the killer some sense of compensation for his handicap. He explained, quote, He has some kind of defect that really bothers him. It turned out that the second profile was almost entirely accurate. In fact, a woman had actually directly identified David as the man in the composite sketches after seeing it in the newspaper. She called the police to tell them she was sure the man was David Carpenter. It turned out that she had been on a cruise to Japan 26 years earlier and had confronted a young man who had been bothering her daughter with inappropriate behavior. She recalled that David had a stutter, just like the profile indicated. And yet, authorities never followed up on her tip. A month later, David killed Heather. At 93 years old, David Carpenter is currently the oldest monster on San Quentin's death row. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.